structure that uh, tends to consider portfolio debt flows generally as sort of bad cholesterol, as something that is volatile and uh, as often a symptom of fragility, as opposed to good flows like FDI. Uh, and I, I, I have something to say about that, about the, some misgivings I, I have on the way uh, people treat the data on, on these, uh, on these uh, subjects. So uh, let me uh, just uh, skip, go through this uh, uh, really quickly. Um, there are, we try to have as comprehensive a look at portfolio flows as possible. That means looking at the investor side as well, which countries are investing in portfolio debt instruments of emerging economies, which sectors um, are doing the investing. Uh, and we are looking, of course, at also what, who are the issuer of the bonds. And we are trying to integrate in the analysis also issuance of portfolio debt securities offshore, uh, which uh, are typically absent from analysis that are based on balance of payments data because offshore issuance is not issuance done by residents. Formally, is not issuance done by residents of EMs, is done by uh, entities that are resident in financial centers. Um, and I forgive me if I skip the giving credit. There is a very extensive literature uh, on uh, 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 portfolio debt flows to EMs. Certainly, a lot of people in this room contributed to this. Um, Koke has a sort of a, a nice, uh, relatively recent survey. Um, and there is quite a bit of work going on now that is looking at uh, trying to establish stylus facts on a nationality basis as opposed to the residence basis uh, of the balance of payments, and that is work uh, by um, uh, Coppola, Maggiori, Niemann, and Schrager, and Maggiori, Niemann, and Schrager as well. Um, so this is the picture that I wanted to show you on aggregate data, um, which shows averages of uh, flows to emerging economies in percent of their GDP and uh, by category of flow. And uh, just focus on the gray bar, which is uh, portfolio debt flows. And you see it's the, the only one that really went up uh, after the global financial crisis. I've excluded the quarters of the global financial crisis for, uh, for this chart. So it's, and it's, it's a pretty meaningful increase. It's uh, far from being the main component of flows to EMs, FDI, uh, is uh, much larger, but, uh, but it is still um, a pretty important one. And I've done a second picture that excludes China. This is important uh, when you look at aggregate data because as of 2021, 2022, China is the size of the next 23 emerging economies combined in terms of GDP. So you have to integrate and sum up uh, every country ranging from number two to 24 in the scale of uh, GDP size to get to the size of China. So it's useful to get a picture of it without uh, this giant um, affecting the composition of the data. And what you see is fundamentally the same, the same, uh, overall, the same overall message. Uh, portfolio debt flows have growing in importance. So, this chart uh, is the first one that, uh, in the paper that tries to provide some stylized facts on who is actually investing in emerging market debt securities. And it is based on data from the IMF Co Coordinated Portfolio Investment Survey, which is an annual survey where the, actually every six months now, where you um, participating countries tell you where its portfolio investment holdings are for both debt and equity securities. And there are, of course, a lot of colors there. I'm scaling this, by the way, by EM GDP. Uh, and um, focus on the sort of the first two bars from the bottom. The light blue one is the US, and the next one is the euro area. So you see that euro area countries are the largest investors in uh, EM portfolio debt securities. Um, you have a number of other uh, uh, countries in, and areas investing there. You see the US, you see the UK, uh, but you see Hong Kong and Singapore. 
uh, playing a relatively important, a relatively important role. Uh, but as you see, most of the uh, bars come, uh, most of the money comes from uh, from advanced economies, and we actually don't track that well. We track well in terms of overall pattern. Um, the total portfolio debt securities invested in EMs according to EMs. Uh, but those of which we can establish ownership uh, through th this survey are about 75 to 80% depending on, uh, depending on the country. This is a picture just for China. And without going into great detail, just notice the color pattern. Look at the importance of the euro area and the US. Here is basically half of the total, at least. And look here. Um, it's a completely different picture uh, in terms of the uh, who is investing there. Uh, These huge bars you see are Hong Kong and Singapore. It's basically investment flowing through Asian financial centers. Where is it coming from? Uh, we don't know. Uh, because uh, these are primarily intermediaries, but not only intermediaries. Singapore has uh, the GIC and Temasek that are heavy investors in China for sure. But one bar that you should also notice, which is quite important, is this uh, one with a mysterious um, name of Sefer plus SSIO that is fundamentally uh, portfolio debt securities held by central banks uh, as reserves. Uh, China is the only emerging economy uh, for which this is a meaningful bar. Because uh, most central banks do not hold the EM paper as reserves. But this is, uh, China is, of course, an exception. And you see that that bar was nothing until 2012-13. Uh, and is actually relatively large now. And we know that Russia is a pretty big chunk of it. Uh, we know from you know, Russian data. Uh, that now they've stopped uh, providing, but we know from Russian data, of, say a year ago, that uh, holdings by the Chinese, uh, by the Russian central bank, are a good good chunk of that uh, of that total. Um, and this is a sectoral picture. Again, I'm doing here all countries excluding China, and uh, what you see is that a lot of the money comes from investment funds, which is uh, makes it trickier to identify patterns that depend on who the investor is, because of course investment funds are, are intermediaries. And you don't really cannot establish firmly who is behind the investment funds. But we can do that to some extent for the European data. I'm going to show you that a bit later. Um, and you see that the second biggest component is institutional investors, like insurance companies and pension funds. That's the green. Uh, incidentally, insurance companies and pension funds also invest through investment funds. So their actual weight is much larger than the green. Again, look at the contrast with China. Um, just you can, cannot figure out all the colors, but you, you will see that the color pattern between this picture and this picture is different. Uh, investment funds have a smaller share here. Uh, and you have central banks and international organizations that are a much bigger share. Uh, again, this is a picture that uh, is similar to the one I, I in, in this sense, uh, I showed you before. Here is not by nationality. Here it is by, uh, by sector. The Chinese, uh, the, uh, so this is Overall, so it includes local currency bonds, it includes dollar bonds, it includes U bonds denominated in euros. Um, I, I'm able to show you the currency composition for euro area investment, but not for the aggregate uh, of YEMS, because not all of them provide the currency composition. You, you can get some way there, but not all the way there. So you have a lot of offshore issuance by some emerging economies. Uh, and there are a few uh, listed here for which this is particularly big. South Africa is one of them. It's either countries with large multinational corporations, and clearly South Africa is one of them. Um, Brazil uh, is another one, where yeah. Petrobras does a lot of issuance abroad. Yes, but I, in Brazil, they, that information is known. Yes. 
like it's not like people make it sound like it's no no there's country. nothing but also if, if it does go back to the country then it is part of the balance sheet yes i'm going but it's not as portfolio debt that's no, the no, issue no, but, it, but there is this view that if it's offshore it's not no 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 that's so, i'm uh, i'm and if it went back to the 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 subsidiary they used to have in Pasadena, then that wouldn't be part of the balance of payments. No, I'm, I completely agree. And so the, the point is, when, say, Petrobras issues a bond in the Netherlands, uh, that is, from a balance of payments perspective, I don't know who's, say, the bonds is bought by Euro area investors. So it is a purchase of a portfolio debt security by Euro area investors of a debt security issued by a, a Dutch entity. So it will be a portfolio debt liability for the Netherlands, a portfolio debt asset for the rest, for the whatever, who is the investor. The money makes its way back to Petrobras Brazil. And the way it does so is the money is on lent by the affiliate to the parent. And that's an FDI transaction. And it will be recorded with the new BOP manual as FDI in Brazil. Uh, so it's truly portfolio debt. But in the balance of payments is FDI. Um, so this is why I'm always very wary of taking literally the, this notion that there are you know, good and bad types of flows. And FDI is good, if portfolio debt is bad. In the BOP, you have to be very careful because for countries with significant offshore issuance, um, these are perf perfectly legal, clean, uh, uh, above board transactions. Uh, but this is the way they are recorded. And, and I agree, although the one that started this battle, a good FBI also. Thierry was not sharp. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm it's not my boss, and I, I'm just highlighting a shortcoming. I have no problem with thinking of stability of FDI. You have, you know, uh, sort of uh, set up an enterprise overseas, but this is but a little bit different. My point is that there is this, and, and I, I did talk to Jesse about that, that is sell it that is not recorded anywhere, and that's... No, no, that's not true. No, 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 absolutely. It goes in the BOP, but differently. Uh, so I've drawn this picture, uh, which is portfolio debt securities. In blue, it's what you can download from the BOP. And in red, you have net offshore issuance, uh, which you can get from the BIS. This. If you want put them, putting them on the same scale, the same picture, is assuming that the offshore securities issued offshore are bought by non-residents of the issuing country, which I think is generally correct, but you don't know for sure. Um, so it's assuming the Petrobras bonds issued in uh, the Netherlands are not bought by Brazilians, because otherwise they shouldn't really belong on the same picture, because these are portfolio debt securities bought by non-residents on the BOP side. But what I want, uh, the reason I want to show you this picture is because you will s you sort of see that there is a very strong co-movement between the two. Uh, that uh, net offshore issuance tend to be high uh, during periods in which there is a lot of appetite for emerging market debt securities. Uh, and, uh, and notice what is happening now. This, the last dip is the first two quarters of 2022. Uh, and this is excluding China. China has a lot of offshore issuance, so you're going to see a lot less orange uh, here compared to here. Uh, because, yeah, most Chinese bonds are issued offshore. Yes? I'm looking for a big surge from uh, the zero interest rates in the US. And then, do, have you seen that in the US? No. There is, I mean, uh, if you compare, this is the decade before. Uh, you see you have a much steadier. No, but it is 2010. Yeah, from 2010 onwards. So you, the beginning is the, so you have the commodity price boom here at the beginning. Uh, you have a dip during the euro area crisis. And then you have a second period of very strong flows to EMs. And then you have the China, the combination of oil prices falling and China uh, deep depegging uh, in such an awkward way. And uh, during that period, flows to EMs plummeted. And that's this period. And then you have a recovery after that. And then you have COVID. And then you have a recovery after that. And then you have rising interest rates in the US. Also, so they rise first in North America. I'm sorry? 
they yeah, but the in, yeah, but the say the impact on flows is, I would say, is this tightening of global financial yeah, conditions. But that, yeah, but Maybe not. I'm showing you aggregate pictures for all the EM world, and it's a pretty. The shift is pretty dramatic, no, no, right? So if it's, I know it's not Brazil. I mean, if it excludes China, then who is it? Everywhere is it else. The big one, Russia, or like what? No, it, this is excluding China. Everywhere. Uh, from a BOP perspective, most EMs, Mexico, many of them had negative flows during the first half of 22. The big ones, yeah, it would be Mexico, uh, also Poland. Uh, you have a variety of, of others. Um, let me, in the interest of time, go on the evidence from Euro area data. So uh, what I've shown you until now, uh, I don't know how. 10 minutes. 10 minutes, OK. Um, what I've shown you until now are stylized facts from aggregate data. We, you know, you can do, see what the time series for the, this, this aggregate time series correlates with. And not surprisingly, at an aggregate level, you cannot identify a lot of country specific pull factors. You identify uh, um, mostly effects that come, affect global investors as opposed to global the, the, the destination. And you've had a very, very strong negative correlation with the, uh, with the dollar. Uh, you measure the dollar. We have the dollar, as Maury Obsfeld does in his Brookings piece now, uh, that that the, he just he just wrote uh, relative to other advanced economies. So it's not sort of directly contaminated by bilateral exchange rates with EMs. During periods in which the dollar strengthens, flows to EMs tend to be in the aggregate much weaker, and during periods when volatility in financial markets is higher, no no, no big surprise there. Uh, VIX and, and dollar exchange rate ex explain a lot of the aggregate co-movement of, uh, of these flows. Evidence from Euro area data. So this is the share of Euro area investment in debt securities that goes in EM bonds. So it's not just BOP. This is the aggregate portfolio, debt portfolio of Euro area investors. So you see it's about 4%. It is not huge, but it is not tiny, uh, either considering the size of the debt portfolio of uh, uh, the euro area investors. This is a very open, financially open part of the world. And you see, in particular, how sharp the upward trend is. Uh, the data starts right after the euro area crisis. And you see a, a, a big pickup as QE takes, you know, uh, blossoms in Europe and uh, investors shift to debt securities uh, that uh, have some positive yield. Um, this is the currency composition uh, of investment in EMs from the euro area. Uh, the highest share is actually the US dollar uh, in blue. Note that this commingles quantities and prices. Of course, you now with a large dollar appreciation, sort of the the dollar share mechanically tends to increase. You could do it on a flow basis too. This is on a stock basis. Um, um, you see that the local currency component is important. It has come down, again, primarily because of depreciation of EM currencies vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. That's the, the green line. And you have a pretty meaningful euro component, which is what you would normally expect. You have home currency bias. Uh, in demand for uh, debt securities issued uh, uh, abroad. Um, and the share of the euro remains relatively stable. In terms of sector uh, investing in, e in EM debt securities, this is the aggregate picture. Uh, investment funds, IF, are absolutely dominant uh, because of well, you have the investment fund industry in Ireland and Luxembourg. Most investment to EMs flows through those centers. Next to it is insurance companies and pension funds, something similar to the aggregate pictures I showed you for the world. But the nice thing is that one of my co-authors, Martin Schmitz, has a paper uh, where he's 
able to map to a good extent uh, investment fund uh, holdings onto the underlying sectors. And this is the picture that nets out investment funds, attributing investment fund holdings to the sector investing in investment funds. Uh, and this gives you a better sense of who is actually investing in emerging economies. And you see that insurance companies and pension funds, uh, which are the bottom two uh, bars, are a quite important component. Of course, you have households too, of course. As households don't invest directly. They invest through investment funds. Uh, they are this uh, gray bar over here. Uh, but a lot of the money comes from um, Quite a bit of the money comes from institutional investors. Um, and again, there is a quite a bit of difference in the size of these institutional investors across countries. And that actually is pretty powerful in explaining a propensity of a country to invest overseas. So countries with large pension funds, well, in Latin America, Chile is a good example, a country that holds relatively large, or used to hold relatively large foreign assets. Uh, are countries that have de well-developed uh, institutional investors. In, in Europe, the Netherlands is a good example uh, of that. I will spare you tables, but I will give you some key findings from uh, our empirical analysis. What we do here is look at net purchases of individual bonds, uh, scaled by the holdings at the end of the previous period. Um, and we do so first in the aggregate to try to reconcile the findings with the bivariate data I showed you with this aggregate evidence showing that it's mostly dollar. Uh, um, and then gradually add fixed effects to uh, uh, better capture the actual economic mechanism at play. But then you understand better when certain patterns emerge in uh, the data. What you find is a strong preference for government debt securities uh, in uh, uh, investment in ENs. Uh, and we know the dollar share is the highest. Uh, so if you do a regression without adding fixed effects, you find that net purchases are the, the stronger currency um, coefficient you get is going to be on the dollar. It's just reflecting what the uh, aggregate picture showed. But once you control for uh, bilateral country fixed effects, um, that preference, uh, the preference for the dollar remains, but is lower than the preference for the euro. You have a home currency bias. But what happens is that most EMs um, that are destination for global investment tend to issue in dollar securities. Uh, that is true for uh, uh, most Latin American countries. Brazil and Mexico are two of the largest. Uh, and that's where euro area investors go as well. But once you hold fix the country, they have a preference for, uh, for, euro, uh, for euro securities. And it's another nice finding is that you have pull factors. So um, Katarina compiled a fantastic uh, set of data on um, revisions to the macro outlook for these EMs. Uh, these data are quarterly. And we have quarterly wheels uh, from which to draw. And you find the net purchases rise when macro forecasts improve, uh, which, of course, make, makes uh, perfect sense. Um, now, we also have sectoral data, and you can see uh, how different sectors behave along similar dimensions. Don't highlight all the findings. But not surprisingly, because of you know, limits to uh, the FX exposure you can have and all that, uh, uh, the banks are fundamentally those that have a st show a stronger preference for euro securities, euro denominated securities, while uh, institutional investors have uh, a much weaker one. Uh, Indeed, you see pension funds are those that have a stronger preference for government bonds and bonds in local currency. You have a strong overlap between the two. Most local currency bonds bought by foreign investors in EMs tend to be issued by governments. Do you know if um, the pension funds in Europe have regulation in currency mismatches? I, I just find it interesting that they buy uh, It's a good question. No, I don't know. Uh, I, we, we, we could find out. I, presu I, I don't know. 
I don't know. And is it because they like bonds and a lot of the issue of government, sorry, that they like government bonds and a lot of that issue? No, so empirically, so what empirically what you can do, so you know, on the currency, you exclude, um, so you put, we have a, you, uh, you know, a euro denomination variable, uh, dollar denomination variable, other foreign currency. And the, so what you're measuring is preference relative to local currency issuance. And then we have, um, from a sectoral issuer perspective, Perspective. It's only two sectors: is government or non-financial or or business, and we have a, a dummy for government. But in practice, a lot of the local currency tends to be government. Uh, but I can identify when I put the two. Uh, that, that's where it comes from. Uh, so note that I do, didn't talk about aggregate, about global variables. Well, those basically end up in the time fixed effects. So to, what we do is we soak up any global trend with time fixed effects, and then we check what those time fixed effects relate to. And again, not surprisingly, they relate to the same variables we identified in the aggregate analysis. Uh, financial market volatility, shadow rate. Uh, I didn't actually, we should have put the, the real exchange rate. It would have worked uh, as it does in the aggregate, in the aggregate data. So it's fundamentally a US short-term interest rate adjusted for QE uh, purchases. So it's, it's a measure developed by, I think it's Wu and Xia. And it, so it goes negative when, uh, during periods of uh, large uh, bond purchases. So what is the behavior during periods of stress? Very simple. Local currency bonds are sold. Uh, that's the pr the primary reaction is is this. So you see it in, but it doesn't last very long. So you see it in virtually all stress episodes. Particularly, you look at 2020 Q1. A lot of states of government bonds they come back very quickly, uh, within one or two quarters. Uh, but that is uh, the general reaction. Uh, We'd love to have it for the latest period now, the same analysis um, for what is going on during 2022. Uh, but we don't have yet the bilateral data to do it, but we will eventually uh, get there. So just to wrap up, rich set of data on portfolio investment in EMs. Uh, I think the sectoral perspective is very important. We want to know fundamentally also from an EM perspective, you know, do the, does ownership matter? Does it matter who is holding the bond? Do we worry more when the bonds are, hold, are held mostly by investment funds or when they're hold, held by, by a more steep, if you want more stable institutional investors? Um, or also the country pattern. Again, global factors clearly matter. This, we're obviously not the first to, to show this. Uh, I think it's interesting that China looks very, very different uh, uh, along all dimensions, be it country of investment, be it the sector that invests. Have a preference for government bonds and a home currency bias once you control for uh, destination country fixed effects. Uh, what, I, what I think remains a big obstacle to a fuller understanding of um, uh, particularly the the cyclical behavior of investment is the difficult to disentangle the influence of the investing sector when you have investment funds. Um, and uh, that is something we'd love to work on, but it is a general problem in uh, currently in macro balance of payments data that um, a lot of international financial traffic goes through uh, intermediaries. And it's much harder to uh, even to attribute the, to know who the ultimate investor is, and you know, ascertaining what part of the selling buying behavior can be attributable to characteristics uh, of the of the ultimate investors. And thank you very much. And I'll stop here.
Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. It's a real, a real pleasure. It was a real pleasure to, and a real pleasure to discuss this paper, to discuss the work, uh, the work that he's done here, and uh, what I, and essentially this one is a sort of uh, really a, a data tool de force. So there are almost three levels of data, a sort of a, a, a Russian doll uh, uh, structure of data in which we have all this aggregate picture that is quite uh, wide, uh, and then you have the European picture that is very detailed at the, at the investment level, very, uh, and then uh, even a level, uh, a level below the investment in specifically in BRICS, for really try to find, uh, to answer the question of the, the first level by the second level, and so on. Therefore, there was a, a really uh, an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting discovery. And, and essentially, you know, I, I, I went back as well, also with uh, what Gian Maria did. It's almost, it's almost a map making. Uh, let, let's make a map in the, in the way that, that you did with the, uh, with external wealth or nature, right? to give the information of what is the second, what, uh, what she called the second phase of global liquidity. There is this explosion of the bond market that we are confronting, especially in, in emerging countries. They, 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 they increase after the global financial crisis of the importance of the bond market. And what I actually, probably I was appreciating less because a lot of the, of the discussion and the concentration is about the sovereign bond market, but actually the importance of the corporate bond market, and actually how that is expanding, uh, in a sort of, uh, and specifically also the offshore corporate bond market. Uh, and that one uh, gave a, a sort of a very interesting, uh, uh, was an interesting journey for, for me to go back and to look at uh, a few of the data, a few of the, and therefore, you know, there is a lot of results because, yeah, there is this aggregate result, but actually there is a lot of details uh, that, that, that also uh, uh, invite more questions and more analysis, et cetera, that is quite uh, uh, interesting. As I said, the, 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 the aggregate result is essentially what we somehow know, know in the literature. So this is a sort of global effect. This, this push factor are very uh, dominate the portfolio for. The pull factors are quite weak, actually. Even in uh, all overall the analysis, the pull factors are quite weak, and it's not unexpected. I think what was very interesting, and, and remember you, you haven't emphasized in, in the presentation here, but I think it was very interesting, the fact that the offshore the offshore debt that, that, is, that is corporate debt, uh, essentially uh, is, is much more stable, is less, is, is less affected by these global financial flows, so by these global. Uh, it, and there is also the linking, uh, therefore, really uh, your uh, indicators of the GDP growth story, so the, how much the GDP growth there. Uh, sort of with the, with the offshores, there is almost a like linking. Uh, some, uh, and, uh, uh, and then there is a, a lot of details, but I think this offshore was really interesting to me. And for example, I went to see you know, what are the South African companies that are doing offshore. And essentially, each company has got to try, I also understand it will be when you focus on the offshore, the stories are very different. Therefore, you know, you have Anglo America, you have Anglo America that is this multinational that offshore. But the, the motivation of the offshore is essentially because the, all the operations are essentially offshore. You're in dollars, et cetera. But, and, but you have uh, ESCOM. ESCOM because they, they are very linked to the sovereign. Eh? But uh, there is a lot of heterogeneity. They are very linked to the sovereign, but they cannot find anybody to finance here. Yeah, they have to absorb a part of the risk. Yeah, no, 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 because uh, yeah, nobody here trusts them. You try to find somebody in London that maybe are still willing to invest in them. But, <laughs> but anyway, there is a lot of heterogeneity there that is really interesting and really. And then there is all these really sort of gems, various stories. The, the, chi, the, the China exception is very interesting. And also, what does it mean? And I will say something. And then. Uh, the analysis by investor, I think, is, uh, and also, is, you know, it's true that the, the investment firms are intermediary, but you know, in the analysis of Gabe Major, the intermediary matters a lot because it's the one that, that 
have to absorb the risk, and therefore their behavior, the individual behavior will be. Uh, and I think, as I said, I think I was very interested about the, this issue of the corporate market. A few, and therefore, and there, is, there is a few questions, but you, know, you didn't want to show table, I'll show you one <laughs> of your tables. I was, there is one question that is more a uh, uh, curiosity. Eh? That is the, the issue that the monetary policy doesn't seem, the, the US monetary policy doesn't seem very strong uh, at, the, uh, at the portfolio offshore, but it's quite strong at the, uh, at the overall level. No, therefore, it could be also the story, you know, the, the FDI are not really FDI. Eh? There, there is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of you know, sensitivity there to monetary policy that when disaggregate disappear, but maybe it, there was more a curiosity if you have a, a story there. And then, I mean, the, you know, is it really, for me, is what, what, how do we go, you know, what kind of question is really, would be really interesting, given the quality of the, the details of the man. I think, in some sense, you have a lot of different dimension of heterogeneity there that you could, you know, think about exploring, because you have the investor, but if you have the, all the information at the, at the security level, Actually, you have the information about the company, the sectors, et cetera, therefore to see also how, so what, especially uh, talking about the offshore, but you know, what is the, because the reason to issue, to issue bond, to issue offshore bond can be very different, and therefore uh, you might find, uh, and therefore I put some information on the sector of the issue. Eh? So therefore looking also at the, at the other side. And then, you know, when you have uh, one million data, uh, it's always, you know, the average, uh, the, the sort of the, the coefficient hide a lot of maybe distributional or outliers or, uh, therefore I was wondering, you know, I would, I would like to see the data if there was some, you know, specific country that or a specific group of uh, bonds that have different characteristics that might uh, teach us something. And then the other thing is, one thing I was thinking about this ju jurisdictional arbitrage. Uh, therefore, when you have offshore, when you have, off, uh, sorry, when you issue bond, and I, and I conclude here, when you issue bond, essentially, you know, uh, or too much. Okay, I'm thinking in terms of, you know, in a local bo bo uh, currency bond, uh, we'll have sort of your currency risk premium, and the default risk premium, and a sort of jurisdiction premium. Uh, when you move from local currency and you issue in a global currency or in dollars, you eliminate the currency risk premium for the investor. You absorb it in your own balance sheet in terms of, but, but yeah, therefore you reduce the price. But you still have your default risk that is sovereign plus the company default. And then the jurisdiction premium that is the different regulation, the, the risk of changing regulation, et cetera, et cetera. When you, when, you go to, uh, when you go to offshore, you actually take the jurisdiction, sorry, you, you take on the jurisdiction risk, eh? and the investor, therefore this one allow you to have access to a higher, a higher pool because you read, you read the risk for the investors. Eh? But this one then become an interesting, uh, uh, also an interesting thing because for example, it would be interesting to control what is the difference between uh, you know, Anglo-American uh, US dollar bond issue in Joburg versus Anglo-American US denominated dollar issue in London? Because this one will give you an idea of what is the jurisdiction, the jurisdiction that is about the regulation, that is about uh, maybe also the country. And therefore, I was thinking, for example, why Hong Kong uh, maybe you know, a lot of the offshore, et cetera, is you know, the China jurisdiction relative to, uh, might be actually an important reason of why these two centers become, uh, because they have a different jurisdiction, but they're not. And that one was, I think, interesting from the point of view of thinking, and this is a finish. Uh, therefore, I think it's very interesting is uh, the, uh, the uh, that how this will interact with the idea of capital control, et cetera. Because then these offshore become endogenous in some sense. Eh? Therefore, the more 
I intervene in the market, the more likely is that the offshore market edge the, 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 uh, therefore, take away this jurisdiction control. Therefore, uh, therefore how important is the jurisdiction arbitrage in the devel development of the bond market? Therefore, what will mean, for example, in the discussion that with the IMF on the sort of, of thinking about uh, intervention in the capital market, especially thinking about bond market, because that is where a lot of the volatility for emerging country comes. Uh, you want to protect yourself against these global shocks, and with the, but this one then will move a sort of in the offshore market. Therefore, it would be interesting to, yeah, maybe just a sort of what we can learn from this kind of data. I think it will be there is a lot of this kind of thing, but it was really interesting. Uh, it made me, it was a great paper, it was a, very, a lot of fun to, to try to find all the, all the details, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Laura. So I, I have a follow up on this um, jurisdiction. So, so at least in the case of Argentina, we do know that they issue in New York because they want the New York law. No, 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 no. But the, what I was going to say is that I talked to a bankruptcy expert at Harvard on when companies issue offshore. And we tend to assume that the risk goes back to the headquarters. And it actually depends on how the contracts are written. So if you, so let's say Brazil issue corporate debt in Cayman, if, if, if it's not paid, it doesn't necessarily go back to the headquarters. It ends in Cayman. And so, so. That is true. There are two different sectors, and there's two ways 